Hello and welcome to The Exchange. I'm Diane Buckner. Canada is at a crossroads. TransCanada's $8 billion plan to sell our oil has been rejected. And in less than a month, officials from 70 countries meet to talk about reducing emissions from fossil fuels like oil. Will this country lead the charge against climate change or continue its quest to become an oil export superpower? It could depend on the price of oil, which doesn't appear to be getting up off the floor. The International Energy Agency has just published its latest outlook. It expects the price of oil to bounce back to $80, but not until the year 2020. The recent 50% drop in oil prices has forced energy companies to slash spending by 20% this year, according to the IEA. Those companies will cut back next year, too, the first back-to-back -back decline since the 80s. Those cuts aren't enough to relieve the oil glut anytime soon, though. OPEC nations, led by Saudi Arabia, are still pumping as much as they can to protect their market share. This prolonged period of low oil prices has been a boon for many economies. Shippers and airliners save money on gas. For some consumers, it's like a tax break. But the IEA cautions that we shouldn't let that slow our transition to low carbon energy because it says we're still heading in a very dangerous direction. The Energy Watchdog writes, the emissions trajectory implies a long-term temperature increase of 2.7 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. A major course correction is still required to achieve the world's agreed upon climate goal. Canada is expected to make pledges to decarbonize at next month's UN Climate Summit. The energy industry and provincial leaders have signaled they're on board with commitments. But some argue there is still a future for pipelines in this country. We're not going to get the social license we need to get pipelines built unless we take action on uh, responsible climate change and responsible environment protection. And that's something that my government is working very hard on. And we believe that that will be a key step in uh, ensuring market access, uh, in enhanced market access for our important resources. Right now, the Brent price for oil is about two or three dollars higher than the price we get. Getting our oil to Tidewater would mean in this then about between 40 and 50 million more dollars for Saskatchewan when people who own the resource, more money for the provincial budget. Last week, the U.S. rejected TransCanada's Keystone XL. There are other pipeline projects in the works. Kinder Morgan wants to triple the capacity of its Trans Mountain Pipeline, which ships oil from Alberta to B.C. and Washington State. TransCanada's Energy East would carry oil from Alberta to the East Coast. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has hinted at support for both. Northern Gateway has been the most controversial. It would run from Edmonton, Alberta to Kitimat, B.C. and sell crude to Asian markets. Trudeau had said prior to the election that if he won, he would not approve that project. So is there a future for pipelines in Canada? Time for the big picture. Bill Robson is president and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. Armin Yelnesian is a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And Goldie Hyder is president and CEO of Hill and Knowlton Strategies. So Bill, let's start with you with that question we're asking. Is there a future for pipelines in Canada? It's a pretty difficult future whenever we're trying to get things to the border. Uh, when I see what's happening here, I think of uh, uh, somebody who's um, got a, a permit to do some work on her house, say, and just when you think you've cleared all the hurdles that you're supposed to do and submit all the documents and uh, play according to the rules that were there when you started the process, uh, somebody comes along and says, well, guess what? We're actually going to change all those rules on you now. And the people who are caught on the wrong end of that, I think, do have a legitimate complaint. Um, what the U.S. has done, I think, is quite unconscionable. It's worth repeating that uh, 10, the equivalent of 10 uh, Keystone uh, XLs have been built uh, in the U.S. while this has been going on so it's not that they're averse to pipelines but it's just easier to take a shot at the Canadians uh, and uh, we'll talk more about the consumers role in all this but so far what we seem to be doing is hammering the producers uh, when if you really want to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to slow global warming down consumers have to do something and that seems to be where nobody wants to go right well and I think there was actually just a nanos poll saying that yeah we'd like to see our reputation improved but uh, maybe not pay any extra taxes on anything at all but I want to ask you I mean about you know, we heard Rachel Notley talk about social license is mm -hmm. what's needed here and I'm curious how much if you think uh, all of what's happened with Keystone and all the rest of it has related to 
Canada's past reputation and that whole idea of social license. Yeah, I think the idea of social license is going to become a big conversation as we talk about uh, Energy East, for example, or Line B, uh, 9B, sorry. Line 9B has actually got the clearance to go. It's going to pass to some of the most heavily populated area of the country. It already so, does, in fact, because so, it's already shipping. <laughs> but shipping in a new direction with a bigger yeah. flow and a heavier product being mm. pumped through those pipes. So more more risk but at stake. But why is that okay, then? Well, it's, I, but I think you're going to start seeing blowback on continuing to increase this. And plus, I think the bigger issue is not, is there a future for, for pipelines? I think the bigger issue is how much storage do you want? Because it, we're not keeping it in the ground. It's above the ground now. It's been extracted. You know, extracting it is the biggest contribution to GHG emissions. It's not necessarily burning it as far as Canada is concerned. And now we're looking at globally having increased the supply of oil and uh, liquid fuels by twice as much as the increase in demand. We're looking at a supply glut, as you said in the introduction, for some time to come. How are we going to deal with that as a country? So, Goldie, what's your take on all of this? Well, look, I think it's unfortunate that the choices that are presented here are always either or. With respect to your opening question, it was this or that. And I don't think it needs to be that way. I think what we're seeing here is there's a perfect storm brewing out there in so many different levels. We have a, in the United States, uh, as Bill alluded to, 10 keystones have been built since 2010. They are finding a way to become energy self-sufficient themselves so that they can export to other markets. We know what's going on in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia and so forth. There's great concern about the Iranian oil that's coming onto the markets that'll drive the price even lower. Companies are strapped as a result of those pressures and they may not have much product to move. And yet, here we are having a debate about access to markets. I'm very encouraged with what Premier Notley said, and frankly, what Dominic LeBlanc, the government house leaders, also said, in that governments have an obligation to find a way to get resources to market. And, and I think that what we have here is in a new government is a chance to reset, uh, calm the jitters, if you will, calm people down, and do as the, as the environment minister and others are saying, which is, how can we do both? How can we be uh, building a strong economy while also uh, doing what we can about climate change? Well, well, Goldie, I have to tell you, you're, you're not in the same room with us, so I have to alert you that uh, Armin was actually rolling her eyes as you were speaking <laughs> there. What was that all about? Well, I think the issue here is not actually about pipelines and getting product to market. The, the larger issue is how much more pro what building a pipeline signals that you can keep extracting more. We've got more capacity than we need right now. There is a change going on in the global market. I just told you that the increase in the supply was twice as rapid as the increase in the the demand. So we've got a problem here that requires a slowing down the extraction process and that frankly buys us time for the bigger picture issue. This is about the big picture. The bigger picture issue is that globally we are on track not to meet a 2 percent degree, a 2 degree increase in global temperatures but a 3 to 5 degree increase if we keep extracting at the rate that we are and burning fossil fuels at the rate that I mean, we, we are. Can't, I, we can't never, I, would, I would never roll my eyes but I want to just highlight what our mean just said it's about stopping the extraction so this social license stuff I think is an example where uh, the bar will just keep going up because there are people who do not want this stuff getting developed and it doesn't matter what we do we can bend over backwards two or three times the regulatory process now is very different from what it used to be on the environmental side uh, when it comes to the pipelines being built it's very much better than it used to be uh, but it turns out that it's not enough and the reason is because uh, a lot of this isn't really a about the pipeline itself. It's much more about making a yeah, symbol are, than taking it out. It's not about a symbol, they Bill. Are. It is about the fact of climate change and global warming. Okay, which let's, is let's let on the a guy, catastrophic course. Let's let the guy not in the room say something. <laughs> What's up there, Look, Goldie? Uh, uh, Look, I think this is about, this is an opportunity, first of all, for the federal government. Um, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. So clearly this government is out to do more on climate change. I think we should not see that as a threat as much as an opportunity to be able to say, first of all, we can't do anything by ourselves. We cannot go it alone. This government recognizes that, is already saying we need to work with our provinces, but we also need to work with the United States and Mexico. Yes, it needs to be science-based, but let's not be Pollyannish about this. We have a natural resource economy. The the greener our economy gets, the higher the unemployment gets. So that has to be a managed transition. It requires leadership. It requires a, it requires a plan. We've talked many times about an industrial strategy. This may be that time to say, how do we get to where we need to get to? Because let me tell you, coal companies are in solar. Coal companies are in wind. They're, that process is starting. The notion of social license, I think, is less relevant as the need for social acceptance of the things that companies are doing. Well, you saw Joe Oliver writing in the Financial Post last week about $100 billion 
dollars being lost to Western Canadian oil producers over the next 15 years and saying, you know, Can Canadians shouldn't tolerate this bleak future. Then at the same time, you see Rachel Notley saying, I'm going to put a lot of money into developing startups and having a Silicon Valley. Is this the way that uh, Alberta is? I mean, you can't possibly replace that kind of job I, and that kind of income with those sort of ideas. Well, you? this sort of pie in the sky stuff has been around for a long time. And every country in the world is subsidizing these alternative energy sources. So if the contest is to see who can throw the most money at it, uh, I don't want to be in that contest because there are very deep pocketed people who will keep spending beyond what we can. If you really want to control carbon dioxide emissions, the simplest way to do it is to go after the consumer. And we could do that with fuel taxes. And if we were serious about doing that, we could reduce our emissions far more than we can by trying to strangle the production at different places. But nobody wants to do that. And if you don't do that, most of the emissions aren't ever going to get captured because it's coming out of the tailpipes of motor vehicles, for example. So I think that Canada's record here is one uh, of setting very ambitious targets and talking big, but not actually doing the things that would make it.